and he got a little bit uh, uh, vindictive about it. And so he retaliated by canceling the charters that were granted, giving the government, uh, governmental aid, or giving the colonies official recognition. He canceled those charters. So the result was is that, technically speaking, there was no sovereignty, no sovereign law. So everybody was, became self-governing. We governed ourselves. So everyone became sovereign. And so um, when, we, when we finally got together for this modern constitution, I know we went, we went through a phase. The colonies put together the uh, Articles of Confederation. But that, that, was, that was the business of the colonies, not the business of the people. So when that wasn't working out, the people themselves stepped back into the picture. I mean, this is all theory, but it, it's theory that, that uh, we generally accept in legal circles. And so we, we, the people stepped back into the picture, took command of the situation, and redefined the system. And so, uh, and this is expressed in the preamble. If you look at the preamble, it says in the preamble, we the people of the United States, okay? So that, we the people stepped in. Now, uh, what we did, we had a purpose. We said in order to form a, 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 well, we said where we're from. We're people, we're from the United States, and our purpose was to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves, to ourselves and our posterity. And what are we doing? We, are, we ordain and establish this constitution for whom? For the United States of America. So we the people were from the United States, which is two words, and we ordain and establish this constitution for those guys over there called, four words, United States of America. So, you see, we were basically the creators of the United States of America. And uh, the word ordain means to authorize, to make law. So this is the law of the people speaking. And we, by, our, by ordaining, we created this whole thing in the legal sense. And then we establish this constitution. And the word establish in this sense means we actually put it on paper. We wrote it, okay? So we've, we the people authorized it and we the people established it, wrote it, so that there wouldn't be any confusion, I presume. So I want you to notice those words, ordain and establish. The people were sovereign, self-governing to begin with, and there is nothing in the word ordain and establish that says that we gave up anything. We were sovereign before we created it and we're sovereign after we created it. So we the people gave up nothing. Well, that was a tough thing for the politicians to swallow, okay? And over time, that was not really compatible with, with what they like to do. And uh, because governments like to grow and grow and unfortunately they don't know when to stop so they grow to the point where they consume their own people. But this constitution was written in such a way there was no authority on the part of the government to do anything with the people. The government was a separate entity with its general functions but there was nothing in the constitution that authorized the government to take control of the people. So they had to do something about that. It took a long time for them to figure out what to do. But eventually they figured it out. They came up with this device called the 14th Amendment. Now if you look at the 14th Amendment, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. You see, you're not a citizen of the United States unless, unless you meet two basic conditions. The first condition is you have to be born here or naturalized, one of those two, but that's the first condition. 
The second mandatory condition is that you have to be subject to the jurisdiction. Well, if you're born here but not subject to the jurisdiction, then you're not a citizen of the United States. What are you then? Well, you're one of the people. The people are born here, but they're not subject. It's quite the opposite. The government is subject to the people. Okay? We, the people, ordained and created or, or ordained and established this constitution for those guys over there. Those, by the way, they're not really the government. The true government is the people themselves. We are self-governing. The proper terminology, although we call the United States of America organization a government, it's actually a government agency. Okay? You notice they're all called agencies? That's because they're our agents. They're the agents of the people. They're carrying out tasks that we have uh, mandated that they do for us if they want to get a paycheck from us. Okay? So uh, when you're a citizen of the United States, you become property of the United States. You have no rights, by the way, as a citizen. All you have is privileges granted by the government. But anyway, that's the, the background on that. Okay? Um, so if you're going to be uh, um, one of the people, you have to know the difference between that and being one of the citizens. Now, you can be a citizen for some purposes and not a citizen for other purposes. After all, if you're in your so sovereign capacity, you have the, the power, the legal power, to decide when you will or will not go into a contract with another party. And the federal government and the state governments are nothing more than other parties, okay? So, and, and this is how they, they get you. You know, you sign the 1040, there's your contract, okay? There's a number of things you contract, but these contracts do not grant general jurisdiction over you. They only grant jurisdiction over you for the purpose of that particular contract. If you have a driver's license, that does not mean you have to pay taxes. It does not mean you have to do a number of things. It only means that you have to have the driver's license according to your contract with them when you're doing the activities covered by that license. By the way, does anybody have a driver's license here? Okay. Pull it out and look at the back of it and see what it says. You might be surprised. It's in tiny print. And a lot of people cannot read small print. Okay? What does it say? Somebody read it out loud. <laughs> this license is only valid for driving a motor vehicle. You ever wondered what a motor vehicle? Now we're going to talk legal language here. You know what a motor vehicle is? A motor vehicle is a self propelled contrivance used in commerce. What does used in commerce mean? It means carrying passengers or cargo for hire. 18 U.S.C. 31. Right. If you look under, first of all, if you look at uh, under California Code section, I think it's 15210, that's the one that says that the California definitions shall apply unless there's a federal definition. Okay? So California is not being subjected to federal jurisdiction. It's the other way around. California is volunteering into federal jurisdiction. So that's not an issue about whether or not there's federal, federal jurisdiction. It says specifically in the code that, yes, they are obligated, you're not, but they are obligated to obo obey the statutes. And you don't need that dictionary because we have it specified in the statute exactly what a motor vehicle is. And right. it's got to be a self-propelled contrivance used to carry passengers or cargo for hire. And if it's not doing that, it's not a motor vehicle. It's that simple. You don't need the dictionary. If you look at, at the definition in Section 15.2.10, the state has volunteered into federal jurisdiction as far as definitions go. And by the way, all the states that receive federal highway funding, they have to meet federal standards. And so one of the federal standards is Title 18, Section 31, which has definitions. And in there you will find motor vehicle, two words, specifically defined as a self-propelled contrivance that's used in commerce.